Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. And I am seeing you once again with lecture eight of novel two, that is modern novel. What we are going to do and cover in today's talk will precisely cover um, the critical reflection that we in fact started in previous lectures. However, this will continue in today's talk as well. Um, then we may talk about the questions regarding Joyce's attitude to Stephen Dedalus, the writer's attitude to his protagonist. Um, we may also include in discussion that why did Joyce mean by, what did Joyce mean by the term epiphany? And moreover, what role, since we know that it's a, it's a <coughs> play that promoted feminism uh, in writing, uh, in modern writings, uh, this will also be a significant question to answer what role do women play in a portrait? And now how does this novel then add into the significance of the theme of modern era? And then what role does Ireland play in the novel? Its nationalistic uh, characteristics. Why does Stephen decide not to become a Jesuit, a, a priest is another important um, uh, issue that relates to the uh, existence of religion of that post-war, in that post-war time that we need to explore. Um, once we are able to cover these issues, we may get into a themes a bit more in detail and we will try to um, discuss the themes of entrapment and constraints, Catholicism, again a religious aspect of it, escapism, independence, themes of dependency and independence, and then the most important theme um, bringing joy directly inside beauty, sensitivity and imagination. So, um, this will make us finish with our very first text of our first writer, James Joyce, um, the writer of imaginations. Um, and uh, once we are, we are done with that, it will give us um, quite a fertile uh, ground to build up on our knowledge of a modern novel by uh, following another interesting writing of um, uh, another famous writer of the modern era who is Virginia Woolf. Virginia, Virginia Woolf um, was basically a writer who is again famous for her stream of consciousness, a narrative technique of writing. What we will try to cover in today's lectures uh, will be, um, we will discuss her life and works and um, while discussing that we will try to bring in a note that she wrote to her, um, uh, her husbands regarding her hardships and um, her philosophy, her writing technique, stream of consciousness, although we by now I think um, and I'm positive we all are aware of this technique, narrative technique, but again bringing in Virginia's um, point of view, we will again uh, discuss and reinforce um, of, uh, on this um, concept. Um, and then we will, by the end of the talk, we will try to quickly look at the major works done by the writer. So let's start with our today's talk. And we were doing a critical reflection last time and what we covered, uh, we discussed, it, we discussed um, a question regarding Joy's attitude to his protagonist. Now, what we are going to do today, we are going to have a word on it again and we'll move on with the rest of the questions. Uh, when we are talking about Joy's attitude towards his um, protagonist, many questions come in. For example, whether the protagonist is a reflection of Joy's um, personality. Uh, is he playing his character, his, his representing, rep representing the writer's um, role in the novel because there's a lot of resemblance that can be found in, in both of these characters, the real character of James Joyce, the writer, and his um, imaginative character of uh, Stephen Dedalus, the protagonist of the story. However, in the last lecture, in the seventh lecture, we discussed that and this is not the case and uh, what substantiated our discussion basically was the notes received from Joyce's brother 
and he provides us with the uh, with the proofs that uh, things which are mentioned inside the story um, so many of the things regarding Stephen are are quite not true for Joyce himself so Joyce attitude to his protagonist is a complex question um, on which many critics have discussed and uh, then disagreed for several reasons for many years um, critics assumed that Stephen Dedalus was a faithful autobiographical portra portrait of the author. Um, in this view, Stephen is, for all intents and purposes, the young James Joyce, and he is presented in a wholly admirable, even heroic light by the author. The original draft of portrait was called Stephen Hero. So Stephen is a hero who breaks through the restrictions of family, church, society as well as nation to shape his own destiny, his own identity according to his inner lights which are most of them um, beaming from his love and aptitude for beauty and art. Um, he overcomes the limitations of his culture and environment and soars into a higher realm. Um, other critics, while accepting that it, ha it was Joy's um, intention to present a um, heroic character like Stephen, have, have censored Stephen because he comes across as a bit of a prig and tends to isolate himself from everything around him, not admirable qualities. So, um, he overcomes the limitations of his culture and environment and soars into a higher realm. Um, nothing this, nothing uh, regarding, uh, nothing is more important than understanding that noting this discrepancy, other critics endorsing the perception that Stephen is not entirely the romantic hero that some assumed him to be have claimed that Joyce in fact intended this particular effect and this is on purpose. According to this view the presentation of Stephen is riddled with deliberate irony. Joyce distances himself and therefore the reader from his protagonist. This is an alternative explanation for the fact that Stephen does not come across as particularly likable. So we do not have the strong reason that he is representing altogether the writer. So what happens that he often seems self-absorbed and even arrogant, refusing to be sociable or to be or to be blended with his community. So not all of his characteristics and qualities are admirable and likable. He seems obsessed, over obsessed rather, with his own theories of art and beauty, which separate him from human community rather than um, uniting him with it. So in this view, then the portrait is an ironic look by the older and presumably wiser James Joyce at his youthful self, maybe. And some other uh, uh, critics argue that um, neither position is wholly correct. They claim that in Stephen there are elements of the romantic hero as well as the ironic undercutting of such a figure. So according to this view, Joyce presents a sympathetic portrait of the trials of a sensitive intellectual young man as he grows up and the novel is at once an attempt to understand the young man as well as expose some of his faults. So, this point brings us to inquire about what is this term epiphany about? Well, by epiphany, Joyce meant a sudden revelation, a moment when an ordinary object is perceived in a way that it gives way to some kind of realization um, that reveals its deeper significance with something that somebody has waiting since long. An epiphany can produce in the perceiver a moment of realization as well as ecstasy. The word epiphany does not actually appear in a portrait in black and white. However, Joyce does use it in Stephen Hero, the draft on, on which a portrait was based. 
By an epiphany, um, he meant a sudden spiritual manifestation of an idea. He believed that it was for the men of letters to record these epiphanies with extreme care, um, seeing that they themselves are the most delicate and um, evincent of movements. So an epiphany occurs as part of the perception of beauty, Stephen says, as he explains his aesthetic theory to Cranley in, in the portrait. He bases this theory on the work of St. Thomas Aquinas, the medieval Catholic uh, theologian who he is very fond of and he has been following for a long time in his um, writing. According to Aquinas, the three things needed for beauty are integrity, uh, sympathy, symmetry and radiance. And it is when the last quality radiance is perceived that an epiphany occurs. This is how Stephen explains it in Stephen Hero. Its soul, its whatness leaps to us from the vestment of its appearance. This is a quote from the text. So, the soul of the, common, the, the commonest object seems to us radiant. The object achieves its affinity when this is episode appears in a portrait in chapter 5, the three qualities from Aquinas are altered slightly according to James Joyce to become wholeness, harmony and radiance. So we find that there is a slighter difference of opinion in both of the uh, things, in the, in the one who is inspire, inspiring and in the one who is being inspired. Stephen explains the instant wherein that supreme quality of beauty, the clear radiance of the aesthetic image is ap ap apprehended luminously by the mind which has been arrested by its wholeness and um, fascinated by its harmony is the luminous silent stasis of aesthetic pleasure, our spiritual state. The most famous epiphany in a portrait is the moment Stephen perceives the girl wading in, in, in the strand. A girl stood before him in midstream, alone and still, gazing out to sea. She seemed like one whom magic had changed into the likeness of a strange and beautiful sea creature. Um, another epiphany occurs later when Stephen watches the swallows from the steps of the library and for these uh, incidents I have given you the page references if you would like to quote text from there. The penul penultimate entry in his journal Welcome O Life is also an epiphany since an epiphany Joyce has Stephen say in Stephen Hero can also be a memorable phase of the mind itself. In this case, the epiphany is a sudden realization about life that uplifts the soul. So, um, this makes us now inquire on uh, this feministic movement of the time and writer's role in that by looking at what role do women play in the writing by James Joyce. Um, the protagonist's relationship with the, with the many female characters in the novel suggests that he has difficulty in coming to terms with the feminine aspect of life. As a young boy, his romantic imagination is captured by the girl Emma. He's excited by her presence and he writes poems to her. But Emma is never presented directly in the novel. Usually she is re referred to only by the pronoun she. So she remains a shadowy figure. However, vividly she looms in Stephen's imagina imaginative life at, and it seems that she lives more in his idealized romantic fantasies than in a real flesh and blood relationship. At one point, um, when 16-year-old Stephen is feeling guilty about his visits to the brothels, he elevates Emma to an almost goddess-like status, imagining himself appealing in remorse to her. Um, 
The young Stephen is also fascinated by another female figure who can live only his, in his imagination and that is the fictional character Mercedes from the uh, story that he was in love with. Mercedes is a character um, from Alexander Dumas' novel, The Count of Monte Cristo. As the, as the um, betterer of Edmund Dantes, she is the embodiment of pure love and pure womanhood. Although when, when Dantes is imprisoned, she quickly marries another. And Stephen broods on the vision of Mercedes, forming an image in his mind of a kind of ideal woman whom he longs to meet in, re in reality. In his dreamy imagination, he expects this to be a moment of transfiguration for him. He would fade into something impalpable and then be transfigured. Although he never meets anyone um, in the real world who can accomplish all this for him, his first um, um, sexual experience with a prostitute gives him a taste of the surrender and loss of self that he had fantasized about. He closed his eyes, sur surrendering himself to her, body and mind, conscious of nothing in the world but the dark pressure of her softly parting lips. But instead of transfiguring, transfiguration, all this experience produces for him is overpowering guilt, a prick of consciousness. So to ex expiate his feelings of guilt, he prays to the Virgin Mary to, lead, to save him from the consequences of his sin that are getting heavy on his consciousness. The stage of Stephen's life is marked by the contrast between images of women as goddess and women as hold the two extremes in the way that men can ever experience regarding the feminine energy. So this contrast embodies the conflict in Stephen, the deep, deeply rooted conflict regarding nature in a way, um, in, in his mind, in the protagonist's mind, between the desire for holiness and the desire for sensuality. So it, it, it becomes ironic, it sounds ironic, for example, that during the period at, at Belvedere College, Woods College, in which he makes a, um, sorry, the, the college from where he has graduated, um, in which he makes a habit of visiting prostitutes, he becomes the leader of the sodality of the Blessed Virgin Mary, a group that honors the Virgin Mary. Stephen never seems to resolve his conflicted feelings um, about this feminine aspect of life or to form real rather than imaginary relationship with them as women. At university college he deliberately distances himself from Emma although he is still in some way attached to her and have feelings for her and get distracted and jealous when she gives any time to any other man over there. And he is attached to this very idea as well that um, she may be uh, liking him because uh, he remembers a time when they both were together for a while and he could feel that probably she keeps some feelings for him. It seems that the call of an independent artistic life is stronger than his desire for any kind of relationship whether it is personal, social, um, religious or um, to his nation. In this respect it is significant that in Stephen's great epiphany by the river, he contemplates a woman, the girl, who weighs on the strand, but he contemplates her in a detached way, not with any romantic or sexual interest. The girl is only a vehicle for his artistic revelation. And now we need to understand that what role does Ireland play in the novel? What is this national aspect attached with this post-war writing of modernism? Ireland, we know, is a part of the labyrinth of influences on Stephen that he must escape. The country is the very opposite of Stephen's ideal because the Irish have allowed themselves to be shaped by alien forces and cultures.
They are in this view victims of two empires, the British which controls them politically and the Roman Catholic which rules them spiritually from Rome. That this is foreign to Ireland's true nature is made very clear when Stephen, now a student at university college, enters a house owned by, the, owned by a priest. He senses the history of the place and asks himself, um, was the Jewish Jesuit house extraordinarily, extraordinarily and was he walking among aliens? The island of tone and of panel seem to have receded in space and this is from page 199. Tone and panel were Irish nationalist. Stephen will also soon find out that the Dean of Studies is an Englishman. I want you when you are reading this novel because now we are almost finishing it, you must have some idea regarding the history of Ireland and this, this conflict between Catholic and Protestant and do have a look at the nationalist and national figures of the time as well and what role did they play in the history of Ireland. So the, so the Je Jesuit house is extraordinary, not really part of Ireland at all, a contradiction of a nationalist, uh, of a figure who is, who is, um, who is nation's property in a way um, and a movement's property and his belongings. A part of Stephen's quest is to break through this Irish net of foreign dominated cultural history and create an art that is free. He has been aware from a very young age of the conflict in Ireland because the furious quarrel that erupts at the family Christmas dinner makes a deep impact on him. It shows the divisions between the Irish regarding their own history and destiny. Dante Riordan supports the church which opposed Charles Parnell, the Irish nationalist who nearly brought home rule to Ireland. The church in general opposed Irish nationalism. Opposing Dante are Stephen's father and Mr. Casey who argue that Ireland is a, is a precedent Presty-ridden country. The, the church is a harmful influence. So, as Stephen matures, he does not so much take I sides as transcend the debate. He will not side with the nationalist because he sees no hope in that path, based on the way the Irish people have treated their own leaders, who who people who are not good to themselves how can they can good how can they be good to anyone else that was a very basic philosophy that uh, Stephen had he tells his friend Davin that no honorable and sincere man has given up to you his life and his youth and his affection from the days of tone to those of Parnell but you sold him to the enemy of field enemy who enemy of failed him in need or revealed him and left him for another for his life to give away nor does Stephen have any interest in following the Roman Catholic Church uh, which would merely be to follow a system and a doctrine laid out by an authority external to himself um, a doctrine for others not for themselves so both, both schools of thought, uh, he was not really inspired by them and he wasn't taking sides with any one of these. So eventually what happens is that Stephen does, not want, does want to do something for his country although, but he wants to free it through art, not politics or religion. So when he found these two um, channels not worthy of um, giving any uh, attention he tried to dig a third channel that is of his aptitude and his his passion and that for the sake to free f his country from the rules unwanted this is clear from his uh, penult penultimate diary entry when he goes to encounter for the millionth time the, the reality of experience and to forge in the smithy of my soul the uncreated conscious of my race.
Well, um, now another question that is very important and that connects us to the, the, the ideas of religion of that time and how James Joyce presents these ideas of um, why or why not Stephen wanted to join priesthood uh, um, in this writing. Stephen's decision not to become a, a, a Jesuit is more a matter of instinct than intellect. I would say it somehow it relates to um, an epiphany that would basically reinforce his own voice inside. The matter comes to a, to a head toward the end of the chapter 4 when Stephen is summoned to the study of the director of Belvedere College. During his career at Belvedere, Stephen has become known for his piety and purity. Um, and his peers have chosen him to be a perfect of the sodality of the Blessed Virgin Mary. This is what brings him to the attention of the director who suggests that Stephen might be one of the few boys at the college who is being called to a religious life, a blessed life in their words. But in spite of his outward piety, which shows itself in quiet obedience and refusal to express any doubts, Stephen has already half realized that he is moving beyond the spheres of the Catholic life, or that is not his destination. He knows that for him to become a priest would be a matter only of pride, because he would then hold secret knowledge and secret powers. But as soon as he thinks of the, of the grave and ordered and um, passionless life, dull and pale and colorless, that would await him as a life of a priest, every instinct he has recoils from the prospect. And a key image comes to his mind when he looks into the priest's face and sees only a mythless reflection of the sunken day. And this is what I quote here. It is almost as if the priesthood embodies at least four Stephen death rather than life. The director has spoken to him in terms of the eternal salvation of his soul. But for Stephen, the opposite is the case for him becoming a priest threatened to end forever in time and eternity his freedom and these are the lines from page 175 so these were some of the, some of the critical questions that demanded our critical insights and reflections on them uh, although i have only given you skeletons of um, of framework that you can use to again dig deep inside these points and these questions because as I shared last time that we all have our own perceptions and when we go through one writing and one text keeping our understanding of its history and its, its background and context and we develop our own unique understanding of the fact so if there is something that you still feel you can add into its skeleton do that and then try to uh, you know explain it in detail for your understanding and then definitely for the preparation of your assessment alright this makes us to start with um, uh, a bit more discussion regarding the, the major themes in the story and this time we are going to start with um, entrapment and constraints Catholicism escapism, independence, beauty, sensitivity and imagination. So let's start with the very first one that is entrapment and constraint. Well Stephen eventually comes to see Ireland as a kind of um, a trap, a restraint, a limited structure that will make it impossible for him to live and create because he is a, he is an artist who would like to create so to feel that he is living and the kind of structure that he was in that was fairly divided into two streams one was religious and the other was political and um, to his dismay he wasn't really agreeing to any one of them for uh, for the reasons they would present uh, so three major bonds um, uh, threaten family, nation and the church. Um, Stephen's family increasingly destitute is a source of frustration and guilt to him. 
all these three dimensions were in a way kind of ways which he couldn't really proceed to. He couldn't do uh, anything to help them and the continued uh, inaptitude of his father exasperates Stephen. So eventually what does he do? Um, he finds his own way. Though his father is an ardent nationalist, Stephen has great anxieties about Irish politics. So what happens that he finds the Irish people um, fickle and ultimately disloyal. At one point, uh, he says to a friend that the Irish have never had a great leader whom they did not betray or abandon. He also rebels against the nature of activists like uh, petition signing and protest. In his mind, these activities amount to an abduction of independence, so he would not favor any of them at all. At the same time, he leaves Ireland hoping to forge the new concise uh, conscience of his race. Um, Catholic, Catholic, Catholicism, Catholicism is, is the religious um, dispute of the time, basically. Um, a religious disbalance that the society was into. The church is perhaps the greatest constraint on Stephen and merits its own entry. The teachings of church and religion run contrary to Stephen's independent spirit and intellect and he was not able to reconcile with them nor he was able to intellectually digest them or find the logics or answer to his questions. And the very vivid um, contrast between internal and external realities will give rise to so many questions that always remained unanswered. Um, his sensitivity to beauty and the human body are not at all suitable to the rigid Catholic Catholicism in which he was raised. So, but the church continues to exert some small hold on him because of um, the change, the shift of uh, one extreme to another in his life. He, the church and religion um, I would say keep significant position in his life and in his making of what he was at that time. Although he eventually becomes an unbeliever, he continues to have some fear that the Catholic Church might be correct somewhere. Despite his fears, he eventually chooses to live independently um, and without constraint, even if that decision sends him to hell. He was ready for that. And now a word about the theme of escapism in the story. Um, escape is the natural complement to the theme of uh, entrapment and constraint in fact. Or I would say a kind of reaction to it. Joyce depicts escape metaphorically by the book's most important symbol and illusion. The mythical artificer Dedalus, Dedalus is not at all an Irish name. Joyce took the name from the mythical inventor who escaped from his island prison by constructing wings made of wax and flying to his freedom. Stephen too will eventually escape from the island prison of, uh, prison of Ireland. And again, a theme of independence that keeps um, uh, a very significant position. Closely related to the above theme, the just before now discussed theme, theme of escapism, Stephen's move towards independence is one of the central movements of the novel. Stephen's escapism, Stephen gets escaped from the, the world of um, limitations. When we first encounter Stephen as a young boy, um, his athletic inaptitude and sensitive, sensitive nature make him an easy target for bullies. So what happens is that he is a rather shy and awkward boy and would not like to talk about things that he really can't do. Um, the contrast with the university student Stephen could not be greater. The older Stephen is fiercely independent willing to risk eternal damnation to pursue his destiny. 
So he is not cowed by anyone and he will pursue life as an artist no matter what the cost because there lies its, 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 its own, his own self, his identity, identity he would like to make. So th this brings us to his identity, his aptitude and that is beauty, sensitivity and imagination eventually leading to creation, creativity. What begins as sensitivity and imagination in the child, Stephen, eventually evolves into a near obsessive contemplation of beauty and the mechanics of art. Even as a child, young Stephen is, a, is an extraordinarily imaginative and sensitive boy. Eventually what happens is that these strong but unarticulated feelings take a shape as a passion for the arts. You will find in chapter 5 that Stephen has developed a theory of aesthetics um, that is quite sophisticated for a university student. Um, he thinks carefully and thoroughly about beauty and the power of art and knows that he can do nothing else but pursue the life of a poet and writer. So, this was all about our talk regarding um, James Joyce and his famous writing, A Portrait. And today, uh, we are officially finished with our very first text of the term. And I will here recommend you that I know that you have finished your first te text, you read it thoroughly, and by the help of these um, seven and a half lectures so far, you have been able to understand it quite quite well. However, if still there is some, some ambiguity left, I will advise you to go back to your reading once again, do it once more and you will find now with, with the background of having read it once and with all this discussion based on these lectures, you will find, you will have new insights or I would say deep insights of the same kind of understanding and your understanding will get reinforced. At the same time, I promise you that by the end of the, this term, I will, I will try my best to provide you with some kind of revision lectures to fill in whatever gaps are left on your end. So, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim once again, because now we are going to start with our second writer and the text by her, and the second writer is Virginia Woolf. Well, regarding Virginia, Virginia Woolf, um, the timeline is from 1882 to 1941. So again, she is um, a kind of a representer of um, early 20th century, just like James Joyce. Before that we start with um, the, the famous writing by Virginia Woolf, we need to understand a bit of a, her background and um, we will see again uh, that how her background, social, personal and as well as political uh, affects her writings. Well, um, Virginia Woolf was a British novelist regarded as one of the foremost modernist literary figures of the 20th century. Her stream of consciousness technique, a narrative technique and poetic style are among the most important contributions to the modern novel. And this will make you understand why we have uh, selected these writers for you to get oriented with the 20th century. So, although she was married to Leonard Wolf from 1912 until her death in 1941, some of Virginia's strongest romantic ties were with women. That's quite a, uh, quite a uh, insight. In 1917, with her husband, she founded the Hogarth Press, with, which became the first to publish Segment Fried in English and this greatly inspired Wolf. And for your information, I tell you that this was um, a kind of um, a publishing press that initially started with um, publication of um, handwritten journals. The Hogarth Press also published T.S. Eliot, Catherine Mansfield, and Catherine Mansfield was one of very good friends with Virginia Wolf, Maxim Corky, and all Wolf's writings. 
1941 at the on onset of another mental breakdown which he feared would be permanent Virginia Woolf filled her pockets with stones and drowned herself in the river River Auser near her home in the village leaving the following suicide note for her husband and sister um let's see what is in this note by virginia wolf that she writes to her husband lenard sydney uh, for your for your um, information i would like to tell that lenard sydney was her second husband well she writes that dearest i feel certain i'm going mad again i feel we can't go through another of these terrible times and i shan't recover this time I begin to hear voices and can't concentrate so I'm doing what seems the best thing to do you have given me the greatest possible happiness you have been in every way all that anyone could do I don't think two people could have been happier till this terrible disease came I can't fight any longer I know that I'm spoiling your life that without me you could work and you will i know you see i can't even write this properly i can't read what i want to say is i owe all the happiness of my life to you you have been entirely patient with me and incredibly good i want to say that everybody knows it if anybody could have saved me it would have been you everything has gone from me but the certainty of your goodness I can't go on spoiling your life any longer. I don't think two people could have been happier than we have been. And that that is that is what she writes to her husband. Um what happens that in 1905 uh, Virginia became writing prof uh, prof professionally for the Times literary supplement. At the same time she and her sister and brothers established a household in the Bloomsbury section of London which became a gathering place for members of the London intelligentsia between the world wars the Bloomsbury group was a group of intellectuals inspired the trends and in ideas in modern 20th century thinking philosophy and art and Virginia Woolf is considered one of the greatest innovator of the English language in the words of E.M. Forster um she pushed the english language a little further against the dark and her literary achievements and creativity are influential ev even today wolf is the major lyrical novelist in the english language her novels are highly experimental a narrative frequently un um eventful and commonplace is reflected and sometimes almost dissolved in the character's receptive consciousness intense lyricism and stylistic virtuosity fused to create a world overburdened with overburdened with ad, auditory and visual impressions that is what virginia virginia's writing skill is and here we see that um what kind of stream of consciousness that virginia would also call interior monologue she presented to 20th century um she calls it a narrative technique and non dramatic fiction and uh, she says that this employs literary devices such as devolution of the thoughts passing through the mind of the protagonist through snatches of incoherent thoughts free association of ideas and images ungrammatical con constructions self analysis dramatized inner conflicts imagined dialogues these are the characteristics of stream of consciousness technique if you are ever asked to describe it examination of the psychological and emotional motives of characters almost no action all events occur in the character's mind substitution of linear narrative by a fractured one so these are the characteristics of this narrative device that um it reveals the thought passing through a mind it tells what is happening in the mind or inside of the character 
and when it is how does it what kind of traces it provides it provides by snatching a co incoherent thought as raw as it is um, a free association of ideas and images by you know when you look at something um, at the spur of the moment something comes to your mind it can be a word it can be a phrase it can be a sentence or it can be anything in the world so by connecting these two um, the moment when you are watching it and the moment when you are thinking connecting both of them into into words which are free of um, any grammatical uh, structures is what a stream of consciousness is then again it's self analysis looking into your own self and uh, dramatizing your inner conflicts and imagining dialogues with one's own self so what it helps it helps examining the psychological and emotional motives of character and this uh, needs no action at all because it, it is all imaginative it is all happening in character's mind and it, it substanti it's substitution of linear narrative by a fract fractured one. So, uh, what are the outcomes of this artistic device? That it is the presentation of the full richness, um, speed, and subtlety, sub subtlety of the human mind. It presents a rich um, dialogue of one's ca of one character with his or her own thoughts and feelings and emotions it renders the flow of the myriad impressions visual auditory and physical etc that form the awareness of the individual along with his rational thoughts because these writers would believe that words are not enough to reveal its totality of reality if you want to know what is more what is more of a human if you want to know a human being you need to get into inside of that person and try to find out the psychological activities happening in his or her mind that are basically derived by his feeling emotions experiences as well as observation and these writers would believe that a lot of one's, ex one's, one's knowledge would go into his or her observations and things that are thought but not said so what are those thought aspects are covered by this stream of consciousness so it helps the readers penetrate into explorations of the workings of the human consciousness. So we see that um, Virginia, Virginia Woolf presented um, her um, wonderful works starting in 1915, The Voyage Out, 1919, Night and Day, 22, Jacob's Room, 23, Fresh Water, that's only play. 25, Mrs. Dalloway. 27, To the Lighthouse, her, um, her um, literary bomb, I would say. 22, A Biography of Orlando. 29, A Room of One's Own, a kind of autobiographical um, bi bi biographical, um, compilation based on letters. 31, The Waves. 1941, Between the Acts, Last Work. So the beauty of the world, which is so soon to perish, has two edges, one of laughter, one of anguish, cutting the heart asunder, that the philosophy lies in, in all of her writing. So, um, now let us have a look at uh, her biography in writing and what I've planned for you um, after knowing biography in writing I would want you to watch a couple of uh, clips from um, several autobiographical movies that are that are available and I try to take a few minutes out of um, long narration so you can uh, construct a kind of relationship with um, with this information and you're able to uh, keep this in your mind because when we are reading Virginia Woolf you really need to understand what kind of life she has she had gone through what kind of experiences and observation um, uh, she had because most of them uh, enabled her to uh, to present herself in her writings what she presented in, 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 in uh, many of them so, uh, quickly go through the, the verbal part of it and then taking you into the visual part, I would like to tell you that she born into, uh, she born on January 25, 1982 in a house at number 22 Hyde Park Gate by Sir 
um, Liesel and Julia um, Princip uh, Stephen. Her father was already an eminent Victorian man of letters, so she grew up in a literary and intellectual atmosphere and her education cr came from private Greek lessons. She was not an educated girl right from the beginning for her formal education. She had her education privately and most of the part of her education is based on basically on her own readings. A ball from her father's library where she read whatever she liked and this, this aspect is captured in detail in one of the clips that you would watch uh, shortly. She spent her summers at St. Ivers at at Talent House, this was, this was her childhood memory, and she would love staying at this at this place. And um, interestingly, this this becomes her place of death as well. In his, in, in this became her place of death in her later life as well. The house and the sea remain central to her art and to her writings as well, figuring in the setting of some her some of her novels. The death of her mother in 1895, when Virginia was only 13, affected her deeply and brought about her first nervous breakdown. After the father died in 1904, together her sister Vanessa and her brother uh, Toby decided to move to the light and hair of Bloomsbury, where Toby in 1905 began holding Thursday evening at home with his Cambridge friends, Clive Bell, Leonard Wolf, Lytton Strachey. This was the beginning of what came be called Bloomsbury Group. In 1912, Virginia married Leonard Wolf and in the 1950 published The Voyage Out, her first novel. Becoming haunted by the terror of losing her mind, choose the only possible death for her, death by water, and drowned herself in the river Ouse. So this makes you ready to take this visual trip through her writings and see what kind of n narratives are available regarding Virginia Woolf's history, her personal life. Uh, the very first um, clip is going to take you to introduce you to Virginia Woolf's birth and early housing. It will show you the place she lived in in the, in the beginning of her career, her life rather, and will show you her father and family and the kind of domestic setting where she grew up. London in the 19th century was a city of contrasts. There were the leisured rich with their secure incomes and elegant lifestyle, and there were the desperately poor In between were the mass of professional people, office workers, tradesmen, people of all sorts who formed the lower and middle classes. Somewhere towards the upper end of the scale, living in the respectable area of Kensington, were the Stephen family. Virginia Stephen was born at 22 Hyde Park Gate on January 25, 1882. The tall house with its dark and narrow interior was to be her home until her father's death some 22 years later. Both of her parents had been married before and had been widowed. Leslie Stephen, her father, had been married to a daughter of William Thackeray. Julia, Virginia's mother, already had three children from her marriage to Herbert Duckworth. The Duchess of Bedford was her first cousin, and she came from an artistic background. Leslie Stephen was a man of many and varied talents. Like his father and grandfather before him, he was a writer. He also edited the Cornhill magazine for a number of years, and was the first editor of the Dictionary of National Biography, a monumental work which includes biographies of all men of note in English history. Virginia was their third child, following Vanessa and Toby, and to be followed by Adrian. This meant a household of eight children, the older four separated from the younger by about ten years. There were seven servants, all women, which was not an excessive number for a family of the size and status of the Stevens, in those days before any of the modern conveniences which have so changed the way in which people live. 
So you must have enjoyed this clip because this, this has oriented you with the kind of atmosphere where, where uh, Virginia Woolf um, started the early years of her life. Well, um, in this second clip, you will, you will watch her leisures and aptitude, what kind of activities she would keep up in her free times and what kind of interest and habits and aptitude she had right from the beginning. And you will also watch that um, Wolf's schooling, her education wasn't a formal education, rather she had it privately and most of, the, most of that came from her own private readings from the library of her father. And you will also watch that Wolf's habit of reading and play of words and how in the, in the very early age she became quite proficient for using words for her reasons. And eventually in 1891 she starts off Wolf's handwritten magazine. That is an achievement for a girl who is not formally educated. Through her earliest years Virginia became familiar with London streets and played often in Kensington Gardens, which were only a hundred yards from her home. As she grew older, there would be skating on the long water in the park. The Stevens knew many of the literary and intellectual figures of the day. Throughout her childhood, Virginia would have encountered such people as Tennyson, George Eliot, and Henry James. As he talked, Henry James would tilt back his chair further and further as he became more and more involved in what he was saying. To the children's delight, he fell over backwards on one occasion, but still finished what he had to say, lying on his back on the floor. At home in London, Virginia spent much of her time in the tall, narrow house, to which her father had added an extra two stories to accommodate his large household. For although Toby and Adrian were sent to school, the two girls were not. In those days, boys went to school and university, but even in such an intellectually active and enlightened family as this, girls were expected merely to acquire the necessary accomplishments and marry. Vanessa and Virginia were educated at home by their parents. By all accounts, they were poor teachers, seemingly unable to understand how children could find difficult things which to them were obvious. Both lost their tempers easily, so it fell to the girls to educate themselves. Virginia always felt the lack of a formal education, but the rigorous course of reading she set herself must have been almost more appropriate to her eventual career as a writer. She was a sensitive child, but although she was late in learning to speak, she was very soon using words with extraordinary facility. She was accident-prone and excitable, sometimes wild and prey to what her family called purple rages. She was always the family storyteller, and indeed, she and Vanessa decided very early that they would be, respectively, writer and painter. And so it turned out. In 1891, they started a handwritten magazine, the weekly Hyde Park Gate News, which reported incidents in the household. Well, I hope you liked the clip. Let us move on to the third cl clip now. Um, this clip is regarding um, her childhood, the happiest part of her life, and relevance of lighthouse with this time. Four years old, Virginia, uh, you will find and you will see, and the literary acquaintances she had with Henry James, most importantly. And you will see Virginia's interest in physical surroundings around her. The highlight of Virginia's year was the family holiday at St. Ives in Cornwall, where they spent several weeks every summer from her earliest childhood until she was 14. The whole family stayed at Talland House, which overlooks Carbis Bay and the Godrevy Lighthouse, and surrounded themselves with friends and relations. It is difficult to underestimate the importance of these annual pilgrimages to Virginia, since they undoubtedly gave her her happiest moments, in this the happiest part of her childhood. Memories of this time permeate her novels. 
the waves, Jacob's room, and most especially to the lighthouse, draw upon her holidays here. Virginia's sister Vanessa recognized in To the Lighthouse an almost perfect recreation of their parents. The father dominant but insecure, the mother extraordinarily good but almost too accepting of him. In the garden they played croquet and cricket. This is the four-year-old Virginia and the batsman is her brother Adrian. By the time she was ten her family were calling her the Demon Bowler, and her elder brother Toby thought her a better player than many of his contemporaries at prep school. They had many visitors, from the famous, like Henry James and George Meredith, to the very young, like the future poet Rupert Brooke, who was an enthusiastic participant in the daily games of cricket. The children mixed little with everyday life in St. Ives, preferring their own company. But Virginia derived great joy from the physical surroundings. Wasn't that quite an insight? Well, now let me take you to the fourth of the video. This video will, will cover the time period when um, an intellectual group came into being, and it's it's what were its characteristics? Who were the people who were who involved in it? Uh, basically, who were the people who were given the chance to be a part of it, and what was the significance of this group um, uh, of that time? And you will also see the significant figures: E. M. Foster, Bertrand Russell, and G. E. Moore being part of it. Uh, um, and then groups intellectual activities what were the activities that this group had taken and how did they help Virginia Woolf in developing as a writer and then you are shown and given uh, introduction of Bloomsbury group as well in 1899 Toby went to Cambridge University where he soon became friendly with some people who were members of a group called the Apostles it had been founded in 1820, and only new undergraduates of exceptional promise were invited to join, usually no more than one or two each year. Members remained active for life, and at this time included such notable figures as E. M. Forster, Bertrand Russell, and the philosopher G. E. Moore. Their weekly discussions were supposed to be held in a spirit of complete intellectual honesty. Leonard Wolfe was invited to join in 1902. Other undergraduate members at this time included Lytton Strachey, Saxon Sidney Turner, and Maynard Keynes. All four were to become part of what is now called the Bloomsbury Group. Toby was not himself an apostle, and nor was his friend Clive Bell. But the Stephen household at 46 Gordon Square must have seemed an ideal meeting place for them once they had left Cambridge for London. They all came to the Thursday evening. In 1904, she published her first article in a weekly newspaper and was soon writing reviews and other short pieces. She also taught at Morley College, an evening institute for working men and women. 
Here she had her main experience of the kind of people who read books rather than write them. She appreciated their intelligence and saw how they suffered because of their relative lack of education. That she worked here for three years, when her income meant that she did not need to work at all, must be some measure of her interest and concern. In 1906, Toby died of typhoid, which he caught on holiday in Greece. Only two days later, Vanessa became engaged to Clive Bell. They kept the Gordon Square house after their marriage, and Adrian and Virginia moved a few hundred yards to Fitzroy Square. They still spent much time together, and as little as a year after the wedding, Clive and Virginia began a flirtation which was to continue for some years. She was certainly not in love with Clive. Indeed, it seems that her main motivation was her loneliness in the face of her sister's married happiness. Of course, this behavior didn't bring Vanessa any closer to her. Virginia was a sparkling talker, not least because of her almost uncontrolled imagination. She would introduce newcomers with entirely invented descriptions of their lives and characters. In her conversation and her letters, she tended to describe in her brilliant and imaginative way things as she felt they ought to be, rather than as they were. In 1910, there were two distinct parts to the Bloomsbury group. Centred around Vanessa and Clive were an art set who included Roger Fry, who was responsible for the first post-impressionist exhibition in London. Literary Bloomsbury included Lytton Strachey and Virginia, who was still writing reviews and was working hard at her first novel. E.M. Forster was also a part of the circle. Nineteen ten was also the year of the dreadnought hoax, as it became known. Adrian and a friend managed to convince the Navy that their newest and most secret ship, HMS Dreadnought, was to be visited by the Emperor of Abyssinia and his entourage. This is Virginia. The successful hoax made the national front pages. Soon afterwards, Virginia suffered another nervous breakdown, perhaps because of the excitement of this incident, or perhaps because she thought she was close to finishing her first novel. Since 1904, Leonard Wolfe, who was one of Toby's original friends at Cambridge and an apostle, had been a civil servant in Ceylon. In June 1911, he returned on leave, and before the year was out, he proposed to Virginia. At Charleston, a few miles from Monk's house, Vanessa lived with her children. Virginia was bitterly unhappy at having none of her own. Her doctors had decided that her mental equilibrium was too precarious to take such a risk. Quentin Bell, her nephew and the author of the fullest biography of her, remembers her affinity with children. The way that she was able to join in their games without condescending to them, effortlessly accepting their fantasies and delighting them with her company. With older people who saw her as a celebrity, she seemed to enjoy her power to terrify. Perhaps she was getting her own back 
for her misery on social occasions when she was younger. Leonard Wolfe's father had been a successful barrister, but had died aged 48, leaving a widow and nine young children. Leonard did well at school, and was expected to do equally well at Cambridge. He was perhaps overconfident, did not do particularly well in his degree, and did even worse in the civil service examination. He ended up in Ceylon, where he was a remarkably successful administrator. Virginia, with her £9,000 capital and £400 a year income, was not considered particularly well off by members of her class. But the fact that Leonard, as a successful civil servant, had been earning only £260 a year puts this figure rather more in perspective. Nevertheless, Virginia was largely accurate when she wrote to Violet Dickinson, telling her that she was going to marry a penniless Jew, for Leonard had given up his job in the hope that she would marry him, and intended to earn his living as a writer. They married in August 1912, Virginia aged 30, and Leonard 31, and after their honeymoon they moved into rooms at Clifford's Inn. In 1917, the Wolfs bought a printing press and published a small book. The work was time-consuming, but they did it all themselves and made a small profit. The Hogarth Press expanded into a major publishing company over the next few years, and was the first publisher of T.S. Eliot and Catherine Mansfield, both friends of Leonard and Virginia. Catherine Mansfield was important to Virginia as the first other woman she knew who was entirely committed to writing. As their books became more successful, they did less actual printing, but for many years Virginia spent her afternoons setting type, sewing bindings, and packaging up orders. In 1923, Virginia met Vita Sackville West, a gifted and attractive novelist whose family home was the 16th century Knoll in Kent. By 1925, they were close friends. Whether or not their love affair was physical is something that will probably never be known, but they were certainly very much attracted to each other. In Orlando, Virginia describes Vita's life as if she aged from 16 to 36, between the years 1586 and 1928, starting life as a boy and changing into a woman. This is Vita dressed up as Orlando. Leonard published his first novel, based on his experiences in Ceylon, but it was a critical rather than a financial success. Virginia was continuing to work on The Voyage Out, as she had been for many years. As it neared completion, her health declined. Throughout her life, her major nervous crises and periods of mental illness coincided with the periods between the completion and the publication of her novels. She began to suffer delusions, 
and would not eat and was sent to a nursing home. When she moved back to London, she tried to commit suicide. Throughout this period, Leonard, who hadn't been properly warned of the extent of Virginia's mental instability, was suffering too. But he did eventually discover that by keeping her away from excitement, not allowing her to get tired, and making sure that she ate properly, he could keep her healthy both mentally and physically. To this end, they left central London, moving to Richmond. Hogarth House was to be their home until 1924. This house, in the village of Furl, still bears the name she gave it, Little Talland, in memory of her happy childhood holidays in Cornwall. On a walk with Leonard along the Downs, she discovered Asham House. It was to remain her favourite home, beautiful and melancholy. Duncan Grant painted this group at Asham. The Voyage Out was published in 1915 to critical acclaim. No praise was more welcome to Virginia than that of E.M. Forster, who was by now the most successfully established writer of the Bloomsbury Group. For the 20 years after its publication, she experienced no major breakdowns and settled down to married life and to writing. Many of her friends from this time onwards were completely unaware of her history of mental illness. To them she appeared lively and balanced. She was indeed happy for much of the time, thanks to the stability which Leonard had brought to her life. Theirs was a successful marriage, and it is quite likely that without Leonard's love and support, Virginia would never have been able to write as she did. To her dismay, they had to leave Asham in 1919, and they moved a mile or so to Monk's house, Rodmel. Monk's house was their country home until Virginia died. There was no mains water, gas or electricity, but as her novels became more and more successful, they were able to improve the house and employ a gardener. In Jacob's room, which is in part a memorial to her brother Toby, she broke with the traditional form of the English novel. The real turning point came in 1926 with the success of To the Lighthouse, after which money was never a worry. Virginia was well enough now for them to take a London house, something which she had greatly missed.